And no question is greater or more ultimate than the question of the origins of intelligent life. Now, Darwinian theory tells the story of our origins one way. Biblical creationists, of course, they tell it another way. Now, do those two alternatives exhaust the possibilities? Stephen Meyer has dedicated his life and his career on saying, no, there's another possibility. Steve is trained in philosophy of science at Cambridge University. He, Dr. Meyer also directs the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture, which makes this show possible. He's both a good friend and a true leader in the intelligent design movement, which challenges orthodox evolutionary thinking. Steve, your first book, Signature in the Cell, was all about how life came into existence from inanimate matter. Your next book, about Darwin's doubt, is about how intelligent life evolved out of much lower forms of life. And one of the things that's interesting to me is when it comes to the creation of the universe, people understand that uh, there was a Big Bang. Was there a comparable Big Bang when it came to all of a sudden a leap to more sophisticated forms of life? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, paleontologists and evolutionary biologists will refer to what's also known as the Cambrian explosion as the, the Big Bang of animal life. It represented a huge uh, stepwise or quantum leap in complexity of the kinds of organisms that were present on the planet, and it happened very abruptly in the fossil record. And uh, so it was one of the things that actually troubled Darwin about his own theory. He was very convinced the theory was correct, but he knew there were some uh, classes of evidence that his theory couldn't explain. And one of those was the, the abrupt origin of animal life in the Cambrian period. Okay, the title of the book is Darwin's Doubt. Now, of course, we're all told all the time there is no doubt about Darwinian evolution, except that Charles Darwin himself, as your book makes extraordinarily clear, Charles Darwin himself was troubled by those doubts. What, what was the biggest problem that concerned him? Well, it's one of the things I appreciate about Darwin is, uh, unlike many of his modern defenders, whom I sometimes call Darwin's public defenders because they uh, uh, are so dogmatic in their, uh, their uh, promulgation of evolutionary theory, uh, Darwin was, um, he was trained rhetorically. He made, as he put it, one long argument for his, idea, his theory of evolution by natural selection, but he acknowledged difficulties along the way. And the, the thing that, that was troubling to him about the, the, the first animals that arose in the fossil record was first that the, the pattern in the fossil record didn't match the tree-like pattern that he had expected to see. He depicted the history of life as a great branching tree where all of the complex forms of life we see today arose from a simpler one-celled organism way back in the primordial and very ooze. gradually. And ev very, all the changes, gradually. exactly, all very gradually. And yet the first animals emerged very abruptly in the fossil record. And this didn't match that depiction of biological history that was part of his theory. The other thing that troubled him about it is that he knew that the mechanism of natural selection must uh, <clears throat> act very gradually and slowly on random variations. And so the mechanism couldn't generate that much new change or form in the amount of time depicted by the fossil record. So it, the Cambrian re represented a kind of twofold mystery. The mechanism didn't explain where the, the animal form came from, and the picture of the history of life that he had um, advanced di didn't match the evidence either. Okay, when you're talking about the Cambrian explosion, you're not talking about a literal Big Bang. No, it's... Some kind of terrorist... No, no, no. It's explain. not a destructive explosion. It's, in fact, a creative explosion. It's, a, a, um, it's an explosion of innovation in the sense of new, new types of forms, of, new forms of animal life coming into the fossil record. Darwin knew about the Cambrian explosion from a few iconic forms of life that uh, we would recognize probably like trilobites and uh, uh, a bivalve called uh, brachiopods. Well, what and, is and a trilobite? A trilobite is uh, an arthropod, meaning it has a hard exoskeleton with compound eyes, three separate lobes of its, of its body. I've got a picture of it on the front, a yep. picture of a nice fossil on the front cover of Darwin's Doubt. So main point here is that Darwin knew about the Cambrian from a few well-known forms in the 19th century. He expected that future fossil finds would fill in the missing ancestral forms in those lower 
Precambrian layers, so that the the gaps and the abrupt appearance would 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 dissolve with 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 future discoveries. What's happened defied his expectations, as we've learned about new forms of animal life, or as, as sorry, as we've discovered new Cambrian finds around the world. We've discovered many more forms of of animal life than even Darwin knew, and each of those have in turn lacked ancestral precursors in the lower strata. So the explosion, from our point of view, has gotten progressively more expl- explosive with each new fossil find. Okay. There are two problems, as I read your book, from this fossil record. One, of course, is that there's not enough time for all of this animal life to, boom, uh, all of a sudden evolve from the same origins. And the other is the incredible number, the, the number of different kinds of animal forms that seem to have arrived on planet Earth relatively simultaneously. Yeah, the, the, there, it depends on how you classify things, but the largest division in biological classification of animal life is called the phyla. And there have been about 36, there are about 36, three dozen or so known phyla throughout the history of the planet. This is be, you know, each phylum would correspond to a unique body plan where a body plan would be a unique arrangements of body parts and tissues, a kind of body architecture. So roughly 36 fundamental designs and about 26, 27 of those come into the fossil record by the Cambrian three or so beforehand. So you're looking at about two thirds of all the animal forms that have ever existed on life or uh, on earth uh, arise abruptly in that Cambrian period. Steve, I, I know that a lot of this information that you're talking about, about the Cambrian explosion is based upon a particular site uh, in British Columbia, the Burgess Shale. And you actually visited that site and that was an emotional moment for you. You write about that. Well, I, uh, took a group of uh, geologists and geophysicists and marine paleobiologists and scientists up, up to the, um, the top of the Burgess Shale. I, I didn't take them. We were escorted by an official guide. Of the, Describe the scene. Yeah. So we get to the top. We've got two, 14, two, two, two young boys with us who are really into this topic. And our guide is a, an ardent Darwinian. And um, he's giving us the party line all the way up. And we're, uh, all of us, proponents of intelligent design and some very good scientists in the group. But we're looking at each other, mainly trying to say, let's just, we've just come to see the fossils. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to have the <laughs> uncomfortable argument. So we get to the top and the, the guide says, well, he, he explains to everyone that Darwin would feel vindicated by these fossils. One of the young men on the trip, 14 years old, his voice was just at that point where it cracks easily. He says, what, he shrieks, vindicated by the abrupt appearance of over two dozen new animal body plans in a short window of five to 10 million years of geological history? What are you saying? And he just <laughs> exclaims this, you know, with no, no filters. And, of course, then the guide reacts, and the two of them are in deep conversation immediately as we're walking down. the. And within about five minutes, this uh, teenage boy is looking over to me like he's in way over his head. He started this argument that he doesn't know how to fi- finish. So anyway, I ended up joining the conversation. The guide and I talked. It was it was a long hike, uh, seven miles down, and uh, we probably talked for two and a half hours on the way down. It was a terrific conversation. He never really he knew uh, something about who we were, but he didn't really know what the theory of intelligent design was about. And as I explained the the logic and the rationale of the case we're making, especially the case from the the need for information to do to build these new animal forms and what we know that about information always arising from an intelligent source. Uh, at the bottom of the hill, he said, you know, it, he said, it got under my skin at first to realize that you guys were on this hike with me. But he said, he said, I'm actually, um, there's something kind of hopeful about what you're saying because I love science, but I'm also disturbed by its nihilistic implications that all we have are these molecules in motion and that all of the processes that produced everything are unguided and mindless and materialistic. Mm -hmm. And it gives me hope that maybe there's something beyond this. And uh, so I'd like to know more about your theory of intelligent design, he said. Other than the guide, uh, for the Richard Dawkins of this world, or the Stephen Jay Goulds, or the other uh, devoted, ardent Darwinians, uh, what do they say? How, How do they explain? How do they answer Darwin's doubt? Well, there have been claims that the missing the missing ancestral fossils are the result of either inadequate preservation or inadequate sampling. We haven't looked hard enough. But 155 some odd years now since the publication of The Origin, nobody thinks we haven't looked hard enough. Many new Cambrian finds have been discovered, 
and each have actually accentuated and deepened the mystery because they've shown that the, the fossils appeared more abruptly than we first realized, and there are many more forms of animal life that we know of that Darwin didn't know about. Okay, so, so given the fact that it's very difficult to fit the theory of natural selection to the facts of the Cambrian explosion, how does the theory of intelligent design handle the uh, geologic and paleontological paleontological facts? Well, a couple things. Uh, There's a pattern of appearance that's called the top-down pattern of appearance of these fossils, where the major differences in form arise right from the beginning, from their first appearance on Earth, and then you get variations on those themes. Uh, The Darwinian view expects the opposite. It expects that major differences in form would accumulate little by little as uh, small variations and mutations accumulate over time. And so they would expect big the big difference is to arise after a long period of evolution, not be there right from the beginning. But that top-down pattern is exactly the same pattern we see in our own evolution of human technology, where when uh, innovators or inventors develop something new, like, say, the automobile, um, there's a basic body plan. And then there's all kinds of innovations on that, you know, four wheels, a chassis, a drive shaft, all, all, everything since Ford and Benz has had the same uh, basic body plan, but there've been all kinds of um, of variations on that theme that have evolved, if you will, since then. So the pattern we see in the fossil record is strikingly reminiscent to our the, our own pattern of innovation in in uh, in the history of of new technological objects. It suggests design for that reason. It also suggests design for a deeper reason, which is that we know that building new forms of animal life requires new cells, new cell types, new proteins to service those new cell types, and therefore lots and lots of new genetic information stored in DNA. But the information, especially when we find it in a digital form, always comes from an intelligent source. So the explosion of new form in the Cambrian period is not just an explosion of new new different types of animals, it's an explosion of information. And the Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection does a good job of explaining how information can be degraded by mutation but it doesn't do a good job of explaining where new information comes from. And that's where intelligent design comes in, because we know minds and intelligent agents can generate information, and the Cambrian explosion is essentially a big burst of new information into the biosphere. One of the fascinating things uh, that you brought up in your work is that Alfred Russell Wallace, who uh, many people say Darwin stole from, I mean, they had a collaborative relationship, but he came up with the theory of natural selection and basically the theory of evolution at about the same time as as Darwin. Uh, But he was so troubled by Darwin's doubt that he ended up reaching somewhat different conclusions. Explain. Yeah, it's an odd uh, irony of history that one of the co-founders of the theory of natural selection, which, by the way, we don't dispute that natural selection is a no, real no, process. No, no, it's real. It's, we're, it, we're it's disputing, demonstrable. It, yeah, we dispute its creative power. And uh, Wallace was a co-founder of the principle of natural selection, but also came to the conclusion that there were certain things in the history of life that required intelligent design, and he actually used that term, uh, to be explained. He was deeply, he didn't believe that the origin of language, the human mind, human beings could be explained by intelligent design. And in some ways, his views therefore anticipate a a kind of revolution that's going on in evolutionary biology today. Lots and lots of evolutionary biologists are now also questioning the creative power of mutation and selection. They think it's a real process, but many leading evolutionary theorists are now calling for a new theory of evolution because they doubt that mutation and selection have the power to generate fundamentally new forms of life and new biological innovations, such as we see in the Cambrian period. What about the... the the question, I mean, in other words, many of these animals, if not all of them, that you see from the Cambrian period no longer exist. They're, they've gone extinct. What kind of designer designs fairly complex systems that are obsolete? Well, we design systems like that. We, uh, we, the, certain, uh, the first inventions of automobiles passed to new and uh-huh. different versions of the same kind of thing. Sometimes what you see in the fossil record is a continuity of ideas not a material continuity. Darwin expected to see a material continuity where one thing would, would morph in, uh, imperceptibly into another thing with, with no, no discernible gaps or jumps. What we see in the fossil record are uh, the same body plans will persist, but they're instantiated with completely different kinds of organisms. So um, the, 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 we, we see, I think, the pattern in the fossil record that you'd expect to see if there were successive acts of, as uh, one of the early paleontologists, a contemporary of Darwin, 
Louis Agassi put it, acts of mind. You, um, I know people are led to believe that there is complete unanimity in accepting uh, the theory of unaided, unguided, undirected natural selection, uh, random circumstances that produce all forms of life as we know it. But you recently attended a meeting of the Royal Society in which uh, Darwin himself had uh, some recognition, founded by Isaac Newton, or I guess Isaac Newton was one of the er early, initiators early of them, the yeah. Royal Society. Members, yeah. What happened when you went to, when Intelligent Design went to the Royal Society? Well, there were about 20 of us there out of you know 250 some participants, so we were a, a spirited minority. But the, the meeting was called by leading evolutionary biologists and theorists who now doubt neo-Darwinism. In fact, one of the, 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 the leaders there had been quoted earlier as saying that criticism of neo-Darwinism is so early 90s. It, wow. it's, it's still in the textbooks, but among leading people in evolutionary theory, it's passe. And they know. And what, what the, the meeting was called to investigate was um, what kind of new theory could we come up with? We need some new mechanisms that have the creative power that mutation and selection doesn't have. And when the, the first talk at the conference was given by a leading Austrian evolutionary biologist named Gerd Müller who laid out what he called the explanatory deficits of the received theory. It's, and they were interestingly, they, it was like the first part of my book. He said, uh, uh, mutation and selection doesn't have the creative power to generate um, morphological innovations, n fundamentally new forms and structures of life. It doesn't explain the origin of integrated complexity in living systems. And it doesn't account for the abrupt appearance of new forms of life in the fossil record. Now, this this sounds very dramatic and very important. Did, did I read about this in the New York Times? No, you didn't. There were Why there not? was. Uh, the, <laughs> well, I think you know the <laughs> your rhetorical question is its own right. answer. You know, we have a bias in the media, but we've seen this for a long time. Is that the presentation? Is, and it was one of the themes of Darwin's doubt. I laid it out in the preface that there's a huge disparity between the the public presentation of the theory and its status in textbooks in science in the, with the science writers of the New York Times in the public pronouncements of major science organizations like the AAAS or the National Academy of Sciences and the actual status of the theory as you find it in peer-reviewed biological journal articles written by leading evolutionary theorists they know that the, the theory is in deep trouble the public is presented with a very different view of the theory okay in terms of an intelligent design perspective explaining the Big Bang of the Cambrian explosion, uh, all of these animal life forms appearing much more quickly and much more simultaneously than one would expect. How does intelligent design explain that mechanism? Well, a couple different ways. Uh, there's different features of the Cambrian that are indicative of the acts of intelligence. One is the abrupt appearance. We can uh, alter arrangements of parts and come up with novel technological systems that don't have material antecedents. That's one of the things that we can do. So what, that's one thing we see in the fossil record. The other more fundamental thing, again, is this question of the origin of the information needed to build these, these forms of life. And to get people to understand what ID is about, what intelligent design is about, it's sometimes helpful to uh, explain the methods of reasoning that historical scientists use. The great geologist Charles Lyell said that when we're trying to reconstruct events in the, in the remote past, we should be looking for causes now in operation, causes that we know are capable of producing the key effects in question. Well, the key effect in question with the Cambrian explosion is the origin of the information needed to build the new animals. We, this is part of the DNA revolution. We know we need information. So what is the cause now in operation that generates large amounts of digital code, digital information? Well, in my book, I show that there's really only one, and it, and it is mind or intelligence. So this isn't a, a, an unscientific or religious idea. This is an inference from biological evidence based on our knowledge of cause and effect, which is, the as Lyell and Darwin and the great pioneers of historical scientific reasoning uh, show, that this is, the, this is the, the, the key thing we should be looking for, a cause that's known to be capable of explaining the effect in question. Well, the one thing that we know that can generate lots of code and generate new form quickly is an intelligent agent.